Good morning, everyone. I want to uh, join in all the acknowledgments. Uh, Mississauga of the New Credit, Machinopsik, Ma Tikitsu, as is proper to recognize that somebody else's laws are in place. The elder was reminding me as he was approaching the podium to conduct the ceremony and asking the drum to open up the day and in fact to invite the ancestors is the way he described it for us, right? And uh, he was sharing with me some of the history of the treaty of this territory. And in arriving here and listening to my executive colleagues as well as Mr. Stevenson help to reflect back the sentiments uh, that we're starting off with. Thank you, gentlemen, for all of your words. I join with Regional Chief Travers, as you heard him say, arriving here at this conference with all of you as concerned and interested, committed, caring delegates, chiefs, council members, engineers. We have Irving LeBlanc, one of our, we call him Bing lovingly, perhaps one of the first, if not the first uh, qualified engineer that we've had amongst our people, hailing from uh, I always struggle with the full name. I always just go to Wiki. Sorry, my apologies. Wikimacom. Wikimacom. That I have, Regional Chief Travers, I join with you a sense of hope. And it's, uh, it's because of your presence, because of your willingness to be here. It's because of the unprecedented awareness that seems to be growing. And we can share a laugh about the Seahawks and Broncos and... Mr. Stevenson fell flat on the Leafs and the Senators with <laughs> Peter, who's clearly a Sens fan. But you notice what happened when there was an attempt for a wager between the Broncos and the Seahawks. I, I don't know if everyone caught that story. Coming from the West Coast, where I come from, I come from a little fishing village. When I hear Regional Chief Travers, when I first started this work and started traveling the the country, I just couldn't believe the massive bodies of water in the, middle of, in the middle of Turtle Island. You heard him talk about his community being a commercial fishing village, Bill. We, we often talk about that. I come from the West Coast, the big ocean, and I was thinking about what happened with the Seahawks and that there's increasing awareness now amongst our people that a museum wasn't able to get away with sending a sacred mask in a wager to a museum in Denver. For the, for the Super Bowl game. There was a mass up, massive outcry, and that mask that was in the museum in Washington State in the West Coast comes from my neighbors to the north of me, the Newhawk people. And they heard that their sacred mask was up for being used in a wager. 2014, this is not okay any longer. Why is it not okay any longer? Well, because people are becoming more aware. We're becoming more aware, and I have a sense of hope that we arrive here with the kinds of support and sponsors in a spirit of cooperation and partnership, the likes of which the elder were saying was always there at the time of treaty. And he's wanting to bring this information back. So these are the reasons why I would arrive at this gathering with all of you, feeling that there is an opportunity for us to remember those, I don't know how many thousands are in hotel rooms displaced from their homes in the city of Winnipeg right now. And I, I feel it every time the regional chief, and in fact, both regional chiefs who have bring leadership in northern and remote communities in this country, that there is a growing awareness of the reality. And speaking of fishing, Bill, the new channel, we won our fishing case last week. We were successful after 11 years battling in the courts. The Supreme Court upheld and acknowledged that the new channel, just like regional chief Traverse's people, have the right if we so choose to participate in trade of resources in our territories, just like the elder was reminding us and reminding me this morning. That's what we're here to do, he says. The, the peoples here of the Mississauga of the New Credit, we're always tradespeople, trading, selling, bartering, exchanging, based on the application of our inherent right to the territories and the resources. And so we're on 150, 150 court case win streak right now. Some say one of the biggest in the world, the most recent being amongst the new channel just last week. 11 years and close to 2 million we invested. 
but we're proud of that. But we're saying it's not just the New Channels, it belongs to all of our people, wherever they reside, including in the Big Lakes. So this is why we must keep coming together. I also am reminded about why we're coming together, and you heard some of the statistics, the numbers around water and, and housing and infrastructure, the challenges that we face. Growing up in the little village of a house on the West Coast, I heard stories told by my dad that it was hard for me to comprehend at the time. My dad was one of the first to go to university in our, in our village in the West Coast. He graduated with a doctorate degree from the University of British Columbia, and he told me a story that I was able to retell this last year amongst the indigenous peoples outside of Setil, Quebec. Innu people, they speak their language first, Innu language. And then they speak, by and large, French is there. If they speak a second language, French. And English is a distant third, so I was having to get help through translation for both French and English. But I told them the story. I said, do you know, people of Setil, that your ancestors are famous? Why, they asked me. I told them the story that I was told as a boy in a house growing up on the West Coast. In the history books, their people were known as Montagnier, the Montagnier people. There's a story of Montagnier young people being brought by the priests back to France with the notion that these young people were going to be shown what civilization looks like. So they were brought to the streets of Paris and shown around so that they could see what a civilization looks like. Those young people then came back to their villages and they went straight to their chiefs in Innu territory. They told the chiefs what they saw. Those chiefs then turned around and they went to the priests that had brought the young men and they sat those priests down because they wanted to talk to them. You come sit with us because we have something we want to talk to you about. You brought our young people over there to show us what civilization looks like and they told us what they saw. They saw that you have people dying in the streets with no shelter, shivering outside in the cold. They said they saw people with no food in their belly, dying of hunger with no proper clothes or shelter around them to keep them warm. Don't you know, they said to these priests, that it doesn't take much intelligence to take care of your people. That's what they said to those priests at that time in the 1500s. These were some of the first exchanges that give us a reflection of the deep disconnect and misunderstanding that was occurring, that we have the opportunity now to put in the right direction. Because nowhere in any indigenous communities in the Americas, and we've got lots of recorded history now that we can look back and refer to, writings and, and uh, reflections of many who talked about what they saw amongst all of our people. Great and proud indigenous nations, nowhere could you find anyone without the basic necessities of life. Food in the belly to nourish them, proper clothes on their back and warm shelter. Systems of governance and care and concern for every single living being, people included. And so you see, I said to the Innu people, you see you come from a great heritage. You come from a great people because they always knew how to care for their people throughout every season that the newcomers had to be taught and supported. And so here we find ourselves in, in 2014 reflecting back on these experiences and uncovering truths through the important work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So they found themselves feeling very proud of, of, this, of this history amongst themselves as Innu people. And this is an awareness that's now beginning to, in many respects, pierce the consciousness of Canada, but also of other countries like the United States and states around the world with the advent of the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And so it's true that there are standards of living that are taken for granted in many respects by many Canadians, I think today mark what they call Food Freedom Day, that enough Canadians on average have earned enough money for food now for the rest of the year to, at this point in the year. We also know that as it was reflected back, we, we invited the Special Rapporteur on Indigenous Peoples from the United Nations to, to spend some time directly with our people and report, and he did provide an initial reflection back that despite the fact that Canada is the third wealthiest in the world, that we still have First Nations, who may rank 67th on the UN Human Development Index. So it reminds us that these treaties that the elder was talking about, this is the moment when we grasp them, 
the young people, the young people have been rising up, stepping forward and speaking out and saying, we're not going to wait. Now is the time our people are in dire need. It's completely unacceptable what we're faced with. So this is also, for me, what I believe provides us with a sense of, of hope. When I spend time, as is the great privilege in this role, to accept invitations, and I see we have some chiefs that are here today. Chief Miracle, I see you sitting amongst the delegates, and, and Grand Chief Mitchell, I saw him earlier. And uh, Chief Travers, I remember spending some time, and Chief Beardy in northern remote communities. Experiencing, as you said firsthand, it reminds me of a young boy that uh, Jeffrey Copenis, my colleague, and I were visiting. His name was Jaden, and he was 10 at the time, so he must be 12 now. It was a couple years ago, right, Jeff? And I'll never forget uh, arriving at his, at his home to visit, and it was a lot like looking in the mirror from when I was a kid in a house. It 10-year-old, 10-year-old Jaden living in a little one-bedroom shed with no running water with nine family members. Sheets were used for a door and slop pails just outside that the family used for bathroom. And in spite of this, I had a great conversation with Jaden because we both like peanut butter. He had a big jar of it up on his shelf and we talked about how we like peanut butter. And then I asked him about school and this is where he got a smile and there was a real sparkle in his eye. He was telling me how proud his grandpa, his grandpa is proud of him for how well he's doing in school. You see the richness of family, like water, the, the threads of the very best of our ancestry, of relationships, of links to culture coming through, even in moments when young Jaden would not, like I was not able when I was a child, to describe that I was surrounded by what others in this country and around the world would describe as deep poverty, of deep inequities that still pervade and still exist and we know that young Jaden isn't alone, and we also know that those same young people are leading the way. How about those young walkers from uh, the Nishiyu walkers who walked over 1,600 kilometers from northern Quebec to Ottawa? And they did so with grace, with humility, with an interest in raising awareness. These are the reasons why we're gathered here this week. These stories, this current reality, but also knowing that we can do so much better. It's why we're going to talk about housing, about infrastructure, emergency management. We often seem to be lurching from crisis to crisis and be asking jurisdictions that don't normally work very well together for us to do this seamlessly. That was always the idea that we would see one another. Of course, water, deep care and concern for the, for the quality of water and of private-public partnerships and connectivity. A good part of the agenda here is going to be about innovation in, in water and wastewater technology, new methods and materials for housing and building construction. And there are organizations conducting research. We're thankful for the, the leadership as well of universities stepping forward to support this work. Some have been mentioned here, the Canadian Water Network, the University of Guelph, the University of British Columbia, we're partnering with in the water research projects are well represented. Some of this activity leads to incubation of proven technologies that have been pilot piloted in some of our communities. We recognize that also the province of Ontario is partnered with ANSI and Ontario First Nations Technical Services Corporation to participate in the Canada-Ontario First Nations pilot initiative to improve drinking water quality. Through this joint initiative, the Government of Canada and province of Ontario are working with First Nations partners to explore and assess innovative, alternative and proven processes and drinking water servicing solutions. It's this well-established practice of private-public partnerships is a new and perhaps not too well understood concept for First Nations communities. Th these are all new ideas that will help in making our limited resources, which is a reality, go further. So today I, along with my colleagues, am asking all of you, how can we use the energy of your presence, your willingness to come to this conference, your commitment to move us in a positive direction of sustainable practices that support First Nations in developing sustainable communities. The theme points us in that direction, building for a sustainable future. We keep kids like Jaden particularly in mind when we gather like this. We've heard already some of the, I think, uh, alluding to some of the, the immensity of the challenges. 
that over the next 25 years, more than 130,000 housing units will be required. And if these homes aren't built right, then they'll need to be prematurely replaced. So we can find ways, we must find ways to get it right the first time. We know that costs are an issue. For the most part, housing goods and services can only be obtained from larger urban centers. Combined with the low income and distance of northern and remote First Nations communities, the goods and services are substantially higher. Houses built in the last 20, 20 years are in need of major repair due to climate change, extremes, poor construction, crowding, high costs, and lack of sufficient income and skill to do the ongoing maintenance and upkeep. Every year, one third of the new houses built on reserve have to be replaced because they've fallen into disrepair. 10% of households have no electricity or existing electrical systems. 31% of households don't have satisfactory heating systems, including homes in northern reserves. In the meantime, our communities know all too well that we've been under a 2% spending cap on funding for First Nations, condemning too many of our communities to fall further behind the needs as they grow greater. Almost one quarter of First Nations adults are living in overcrowded housing. That's a direct threat to our health and well-being. Some of our communities continue to be left out of the growing requirement for connectivity. We will hear, importantly, stories of success this week as well. Many First Nations continue to remain without a level of broadband co connectivity and related technologies that is equal to the experience of those in many less developed countries. These are some of the reasons why this conference is so important. It's about recognizing that there are successes, that we need to build on those, we need to grow them out. Roll up our sleeves this week and keep in mind those youngsters like Jaden. Think about responsibilities and promises to one another anchored and shared, codified in the treaties and the founding documents of this land. I'm reminded about being in, in Britain, the United Kingdom recently to recognize 250 years since the Royal Proclamation, the original recognition that led to some of the first treaties being forged. I look as well to recent work like the National First Nations Housing Strategy, drafted and supported by chiefs and assembly, developed as a rights-based approach to deal with housing challenges and barriers, anchored again in rights recognition in our treaties. And on a similar vein, we've also drafted a National First Nations Water Strategy and Water Declaration. These documents guide us in how we act in respect of the work we do, the partnerships we establish so that we do not lose sight of our responsibilities to protect and provide for our members today and for the future. Much of what is contained in the strategy and declaration is from direction that we were provided at the Water Rights Conference in 2012 and linking powerfully to the United Nations Declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples. We're also working on alter alternative housing options, such as our partnership with Habitat for Humanity. As much as these are not the best skills that I have, I too donned some work gloves and, and got some tools and pounded some nails. I, I hit the nail a few times on the head. These are important new partnerships, such as those with the Frontiers Foundation on utilizing local resources to decrease their building costs. Habitat for Humanity, a moment when a grandmother is able to properly house herself and her grandkids that she's caring for in an urban setting or on a First Nations in the Yukon, uh, a partnership that really was the first between Habitat for Humanity and, uh, and a First Nation. Or also uh, exploring alternative financing options such as the Revolving Loans Fund and the REBA Free Mortgages, the notion uh, of faith-based support as well as a means to create a better housing program for First Nations. I also want to mention the good work done by my friend uh, John Bocage as chair of the Board of Trustees and the First Nations Market Housing Fund, an important entity whenever our people face a housing crisis. Their contribution on capacity building and overall approach hold a lot of promise for First Nations. We absolutely must close this gap on the quality and quantity of data on First Nations housing as well. I believe cooperation respectful cooperation that recognizes our rights and jurisdiction can help us move forward. I know this is one reason why we all have concerns about recent reports that the government is pushing for new laws that would let Ottawa enforce construction standards on residential homes and infrastructure built in First Nations communities. I want to say clearly, let's not repeat 
the mistakes from the drinking water legislation experience. We call on Canada to meaningfully consult and accommodate First Nations on any initiatives that affect our lands, our lives, and our people. First Nations know that a one-size-fits-all approach does not work. Our people, for our people, our communities, or our governments. We're always seeking approaches that are flexible and innovative so that all First Nations can use them. Clearly, all our people have the right to safe and secure shelter in healthy communities, and we'll accept nothing less. Many First Nations in Canada, like Member 2, First Nation in the East, West Bank, First Nation in the West, and others in between are leading the way in new approaches to sustainability. We need to encourage these kinds of successes. We need to see more of them. And most of all, we need to share it and we need to foster it. The First Nation Sustainable Development Standards are one of the principal outcomes of the joint partnership with Adamekshing Anishinaabek, with the Assembly of First Nations, as well as the Holmes Group with Mike Holmes. These standards were developed with the financial support and human resources of the First Nations Market Housing Fund. The three partners of the Building Homes and Building Skills Project and several other educational and governmental agencies. The First Nations Sustainable Development Standards enables First Nations communities to effectively manage their community and housing development. The easy to use guidelines describe how to develop housing programs and standards that result in the construction of affordable, durable, healthy, culturally appropriate and sustainable housing. I don't know if Chief Miller is here amongst us uh, this morning. Chief, are you in the house? We're going to, I know, be hearing from the chief. But what a powerful partnership, though, to have Mike Holmes saying, we just have to make it right. And standing firmly with First Nations, along with Chief Miller and other partners, saying we've just got to find a way forward to make sure that First Nations have proper, uh, sustainable, healthy homes. I want to congratulate Chief Miller and his community on realizing their vision and taking the community approach to developing a housing project that will respect their needs, honor their beliefs, and realize the dreams of their citizens. Chief Miller and his staff did all this work by engaging their citizens and drawing on their energy and their ideas. And their work will have benefits far beyond their own community. The standards developed by the team will be available to all First Nations to review, adopt, and modify to suit your needs, your conditions. The pilot project has opened the door to active participation of industry, the private sector, professional associations, public foundations, as well as academic institutions. I want to join my colleagues in acknowledging as well those who have contributed uh, generously to this event, ANSI, I've mentioned the First Nations Market Housing Fund, CMHC, the Ontario Ministry of Aboriginal Affairs, Royal Bank, QP, and the Canadian Water Network. There are indeed, as we've spelled out here in the collective opening remarks, many, many challenges. We do, however, also have important success stories that can help point the way forward. Like I said before, grow them out, shine a light on them. Our goal is to build on these successes and increase the pace and rate of positive change. This week is an opportunity to embrace the challenge that we're inviting you into, of improving First Nations living conditions with sustainable solutions that will benefit all at the end of the day. These are technical issues and at times complex problems before us, but like I reminded, the Innu youth, their people throughout the course of history, were always able to care for their people, make sure that they had safe and comfortable homes, access to clean drinking water and good living conditions. We must never forget that uh, it's our responsibility, as was expressed in treaties, brought forward in the Canadian Constitution, and updated in the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, that we must all work together to build safe, secure, and quality communities that nurture our children and give all our people, as you said, Regional Chief Travers, hope and opportunity. Tleko, tleko, chimigwech.